So what was Ben's going to do with the other divinity? And he really thought he was going to do this great substitute. He was kind of too bad. Yeah. Yeah. So they couldn't fail. I think you did, but not say you were an expert. An expert. That's good. want to start? This mentioned in the paper topic before we start. We are distributing the second paper assignment, which I remind you is required only of undergraduates. Graduate students, including law students, may elect to write it. So th this is about finance um, and about regulation. I tried to get Bernie Madoff to come, but he said he's detained. And I, try I tried more seriously to get Harry Markopoulos to, to come. He's the man who did the, and he's on TV a lot, and he's writing a book, and he didn't quite see the, uh, uh, that, that it would be in his interest, uh, uh, etc. So there you see some of these bankers. And what I'm going to do is just lay out some of this, uh, the, the, the issues, and then, uh, and then Roberto is going to try to put more, you know, link it to the rest of the things we've been talking about. This is the uh, panic not of 2007, but of 1907 which just happens to be 100 years earlier. People then thought it would never happen again. <laughs> so I, I love that. This is from a, 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 an article that um, is worth looking at by um, Gary Gorton of Yale. So it's the, 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 the uh, 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 panic. Actually, exactly, it says down here. Panic. Scenes in Wall Street Wednesday morning, May 14th, 1884. So 1907 doesn't sound right. I got the wrong, the wrong panic picture. But trust me, there was one for 1907 as well. Um, and I want to start with what we hope finance does, and then we see what it actually does. And I, I, I think it has these two tasks. Uh, and we certainly put a, a stress in the course on the first one. And that's you know, getting money to do productive things. And that means making loans. And that does mean some leverage when you're doing this. Because basically what you're living on is that the, the real economy is going to grow. And the, you have to have some, give, give them some, some sort of lead, if I can phrase it right, or a leverage thing. And this is a quote from uh, uh, Mr. Trichet, who's head of the European Central Bank and uh, at the Davos meetings. And he just says, yeah. And he said they must cut dividends as well as bonuses and start issuing loans to the real economy. So this, you don't have to, it's not a radical view to believe that that's what banks should be doing. Today's newspapers, as you noticed, there was uh, the American um, financial guys are telling the banks uh, they don't want them to start uh, giving uh, the dividends and money back because they're hoping that to their shareholders and b big bonuses, they do want loans as well. So as a general view, that's what we, they should be doing for us. The second thing which we haven't stressed, but is it, it's the theme of Bob Schiller's, the book you we were not reading, but New Financial Order. Um, is to spread risk. And I quoted from this because uh, the first time I read this, I said, wow, uh, this is cool. Uh, basically, what the finance markets are supposed to do is manage risks. 
make it less risky for everybody. And then Schiller basically, uh, I don't know, he got, um, uh, what's the right word? I don't say romantic, uh, carried away, or very, the, the words were not normal for an economist. So he thought, and he thought finance offers the saving grace for every problem we have. Because what we do is we diversify completely, and so if the people of this part of the room are having a bad situation, they have shares in the people of this part of the room who are doing well, and everything gets sort of melded out. And, and that's what he really means here. And then he says the finance is too limited. All we're doing is stock market crashes or hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'd forgotten until I re-looked re re at this, preparing this, 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 this today's talk, that he really thought, and he's one of the most critical guys of the finance thing, he really thought they had made amazing progress and that they had all the tools that we should basically let finance take over literally everything. Uh, it's sort of very interesting. He, he does, I didn't quote this, because you see at the end, we need to democratize finance. So everybody has, uh, you know, is, is, is leveraged to some extent in, in, in some fashion. Uh, but he wants it for the diversification. And that is what it's supposed to do. Uh, that's the second thing. What it actually seems to do um, is redistribute profits to the financiers. <laughs> and um, you see the, the guy looks like could be the president there. He just doesn't understand this complex derivative that they've written that says when performance goes bad, the bonuses go up. And the president may not have understood that, in fact, when you gave money back to the banks. The bonuses were going to go up. They weren't going to loan anything to people. Um, and then the, they've created greater risks and I want, through excessive leg, leverage. It turns out they don't loan very much to small businesses or startups. That's why you have venture capitalists. And then they create these bubbles and, and crashes. So it's, a, it's, it's a very interesting, if you go back and you look at Schiller's uh, a thing, written at the time when the finance was riding high. And he's a critical guy, so he was moved also by the, you know, the irrational exuberance. He, wrote the, 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 he was concerned about crashes, but he thought the whole thing was on this giant upward trajectory. So to remind us of what happens in the world, there is, um, let me get the year on this one, I don't know. Which, which of the crises? That doesn't say. Maybe this is the uh, 1907 crisis. Uh, 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 but it's, it's, a, it's for a play, The War on well, of Wealth, which is a run on the bank. And this is uh, Northern Rock. This is Britain. Uh, just two years ago, two or three years ago, two, 2007, I think it was. So, yeah, two and a half years ago. Um, and had we not had insurance, federal, FDIC in the US, and the Brits, they were insured up to a certain amount. So the run on the, run on the bank was partly to people who's, who had more money than was insured. And not, I had a friend in, who works in Barclays, and he called me up and said, get your money out quickly, uh, because the whole thing is going under. And the, the British raised the amount of insurance and so on. And they, and they basically bought out the North, Northern Rock is still in very bad shape, by the way. OK, so, so that's the. I want to talk about who the players are here so we know who the, is going on. In, the, in these markets, there's insurance companies. And we saw that's AIG, and they've been a big part of the problem because essentially they sell insurance uh, in, in the form of these credit default swaps without having any money to back the insurance because th that, that part of the business somehow or other was unregulated. Normal insurance company is. Presumably, and in their other business, maybe they behave this way, I don't know. The, you know you're, you're sitting there, and you're doing the life tables, and you're saying how long the guy's going to live, and you're, you're really trying to calculate the thing very carefully. You still could be wrong to a certain extent. The brokerage firms, that, uh, which uh, Damon Silverman, who's here, made a big stress that Bear Stearns and the people in the Fed and so on, the Treasury said, well, why should we bail those guys out? They're, um, you know, they're a brokerage firm. They're not not covered by the normal legislation. The old Goldman Sachs, because Goldman Sachs has now declared itself a, uh, a bank. So um, uh, it's covered by some regulations, and it's going to be bailed out by the government if it goes under, in principle. The old Citicorp, which used to be a normal bank, 
for people, mortgage lenders, credit agencies. You can go on and on and on. There are other, other institutions here. The key thing is some of these firms are subject to regulation that should prevent economic or financial catastrophes as it had prevented it until the most the recent period. And then there's another set of guys. And this is the, the shadow banking system. What happened over the last 20 or 30, 20, uh, I suppose 20, 25 years, was there were guys who behaved just like banks, but were not regulated and um, did not receive, because they didn't receive it says here, all, deposits from you or me. So they weren't depository instances. They got large sums of money from companies, from money market funds uh, that were put into them. They behaved as extraordinarily risky banks. Uh, and we'll, we're going to give you some numbers in a minute. So in some sense, the crisis we've had, uh, and there's a nice set of papers by Gary Gorton of Yale about this. There's been no run, except for the Northern Rock briefly, on any bank that has deposit insurance, because there's no reason for us to rush to the Cambridge Savings Bank, because the Cambridge Savings Bank made some bad loans and could be going under. We're guaranteed. The places that have gone under have been places that got money from other big financial institutions that were not uh, covered by this insurance. And uh, those are the, these intermediaries, the shadow guys. And I said includes hedge funds, stockbrokers, dot, dot, dot. Uh, then there's a set of unregulated activities, which some people also call, call part of the uh, uh, shadow banking system. So the credit default swaps and unlisted instruments of different kinds. So why are guys doing this? There wasn't a lot of money being made in the banking industry in 1980, 1990. Uh, 1980s, remember, we had crashes of the savings and loan guys. And you couldn't leverage up enough. The system, this is the scary part of, the, of I think, the, the, the nature is, if always you can make some more money by taking more risk, by leveraging up, and the risk goes to the guys on this side of the room, and it's the guys in the middle who are going to make the money, you guys are going to take the risk. And so they were just looking for ways to, to do this. And the, the, the shadow, does anyone here know who the shadow is? Who is this gentleman? Somebody? Roberto, do you know? OK, well, he's a comic book and uh, radio character from the 1930s. So it sort of fits with the you know, bank collapse and crisis situation. And he's a real guy in the, in the shadow. And I assume if you go to YouTube, you can I don't know if you, you probably can't, I don't know if he ever made it to the movies, so I'm not sure. But uh, I'm sure you can find things about him. But he's part of Americana. So that's the, the shadow. And that, 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 that the shadow banking system was part of this is cool. OK. This is, uh, I'm going to, uh, 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 I think his name right, Gorton or Groton. Ah, oh, gosh, it's Gorton. I'm sorry. But um, he said that. He said this great, interesting thing. The crisis was very similar that we've had to any other bank run, except this was the shadow, the bank run at the shadow sector, not at the other sector. And he puts a big stress on one particular part of this, which is this thing called repo markets. And here he's showing $7 trillion rose up in the Federal Reserve uh, things. And, and repo markets were uh, an effort by big companies. I send my money over to a, an institution over here that promises me some interest. But I can take my money out tomorrow. It's like a deposit, except it is not insured. And it's not insured partly because I, mean, I could have put the money in a real bank. But I have, maybe I got receipts for some event I was running or some big contract I just signed for uh, you know, a mil, uh, I don't know, $10 million. And the regular bank, that's not going to insure that up to, up to that point. And, uh, and I can get better interest from these guys. Oh, I assume no one knows who that is. That's the repo man. Uh, uh, he's, he's a character who has also appeared in Americana. So I just wanted to give uh, 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 you know, an example of how this, this repo market, A, works, 
So it works in the, you, you're gonna put, I'm going to give $10 million of my dollars to um, this lady over here for your, your, your shadow bag, and I give you $10 million. What should I do? Is there anything else I should do about that? Just give it to you, and you promise me you'll give me a 1%, whatever it is, interest. I can withdraw at any moment. Well, I'm going to ask for some collateral. That, that, that if, if something happens to you, I have something so I know my $10 is safe. Or my, excuse me, my $10 million. I, um, uh, uh, and then what they would do, if I really was unsure that you're safe, that safe, I'd say put in, I'll say I'll give you $9 million, but I want you to give me $10 million in collateral. Because like if it's, say it's mortgage-backed securities is the, is the collateral, and I, and I think, well, that, 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 that could just fall. It could fall even in a couple of days. So I will then say I want a little extra on the collateral side. And what you're doing is you're basically giving me this paper, this, this collateral, which is paper, it's uh, 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 promises. And you're taking the money, and you're investing it in something else. So you're going off to Las Vegas. Somebody gave you a, a, a tip on a sure thing. And off you go to Las Vegas and you make lots of money. You come back the next day. I said, I want my 10 million. You say, yeah, here's your 10 million. Uh, or or, or, or if, I, if I just put in 9 million, here's your 9 million. And that's, that's what goes on. And then what, 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 what Gordon says is, if I start switching from 10 million to 9 million that I'm putting in th with the same 10 million collateral, that's the equivalent of withdrawing money from your bank because you now have less money to deal with stuff, and the same collateral is tied up securing my, my deposit. And these are two examples. He gives one, and I give the other. The one that, that to me, was, may, 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 may make more sense. Uh, so I, here I went to the $10. I just couldn't deal with the $10 million. Sorry, it just seemed unreal. Uh, 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 um, so I gave her $100. She gave me this collateral, and she promises me $1 in interest. Tomorrow morning, she invests the, the, the money in something. Usually, she's investing it in something that's long term. She's pooling lots of people's money, and she's going to tell me tomorrow, why don't I just re, re you know, re, 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 if I don't have anything better to do with the $100, why don't I just reinvest it in your activity? And, and basically, I own the collateral during this period, but she's promised to me that she's going to buy it back tomorrow at $100. That's the that's the promise. And she's also promised, I get a, a $1. The asset goes up, and she, she does well. She makes $4. And she has $10 in cash. That's her sort of her uh, capital. Then the two disasters. Uh, one is just that the, the value of the asset didn't go up next period. She went to Las Vegas, and her sure thing failed. Uh, now she's got no money to come back with. And, uh, and, and I'm going to say, well, here's the collateral. You, you got to give me this money. She can't. There's no, for the moment, there's no insurance on this. Uh, though she may, they, I, they may have been, I, I bought credit default swaps and that, but for the moment, just take it as there's no insurance on this. And she goes bust. She's gone. Uh, uh, um, she can't. I just made it to false to $90. Didn't go to zero. That she lost everything, so got something back. So that, 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 that's a case just where the, 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 the shadow bank didn't make a good investment decision, or, or you know, it could be said it took on too much risk. It was taking the money, thinking they could make more money next period, but promising to rebuy the collateral at, at, at the amount. It, it's like a loan. It's the equivalent of a loan uh, that I loaned her the money. It's like the other one, which some people think happened here, and I'll show you some evidence in this. The world suddenly got a little shaky overnight, and I got nervous. And I said, hey, man, I, I don't want that $100 in your, in your thing. I only want $90 in there. I, I take the $10 out. And, and, but I'll keep the 90 as long as you let me have the 100 in collateral. So we have a rearrangement the next period. And now she hasn't got that much money in her investments. Maybe she committed some of the money. And then what she may decide to do is to sell some of her hot tips that were her assets. She sells the hot tips. There's a, a big supply of hot tips coming on the market. The price of the asset goes down, and boom. So it could be one of two things could cause this market to unravel. One is the underlying asset goes down, 
Two, which is much more mindful of a normal of a, the old-fashioned bank run, is just creditors suddenly or got nervous, and we got nervous, so we want some. Basically, we 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 say we want either more collateral or we, or in this case we just put less money in. That's the issue. This is from a Gorton and Metric piece, and this uh, people know what a haircuts are. So I got some people doing haircuts. Uh, the, the man to the with the big scissors made a career cutting people's heads of hair in, uh, in the wrestling ring. And do anyone recognize any of the people in the other picture? One of them is one of the most famous entrepreneurs in America. Yes. Donald Trump, that is exactly right. And uh, he is cutting the hair of uh, Vince McMahon, who owns the Wrestling Association. And uh, they're both supposed to be billionaires. It's less clear about the wrestling promoter. And the trick was they were having a, some sort of, I don't, I don't know exactly, match where you, the loser gets his hair cut. And so the man screaming is, uh, is the uh, guy who's getting his hair cut. Well, what, what they mean by here is a haircut is I start raising the amount of collateral I want for every dollar I keep in your bank or your, it's not a bank, your, your institution. So you, you see here. During the period before this market got un unraveled in some sense, zero. People were saying, OK, I put, I'll give her $100. She writes out the, the, the security or the, the promise to basically uh, uh, it's $100 collateral. Suddenly, the people see these banks going under. They see the, the, the subprime mortgage. It went up to 45%. Now, that, 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 that just kills her. <laughs> So what, what the Treasury and the guys were looking at was this thing is going up. And they realized banks are unwilling to put money in the other bank unless they get almost $150 in collateral. And if every bank is doing that, that means every bank suspicious that every other bank is not going to pay them the next day because they all have leveraged up so much. And when you leverage up so much, your assets, your, 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 your equity can disappear immediately. So the system just moved to an incredibly risky state. Now, there's still some people, it's important to understand, who are collecting bonuses or collecting fees for this. So here's the, the shadow bank thing, but the president's making sure he's getting lots of money or the, whoever's the head of the shadow thing. And, and somebody may be getting fees for, 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 for passing along this stuff. So the, the risk is on the institution. Ultimately, it's on the whole banking system. It's not so much on the guys making the decisions. It's important to un understand. <coughs> so this is from Gordon's ar article and the little book I haven't read. But Michael Lewis is a pretty good pop writer on these things. Uh, and I was looking for, the, for, for panic pictures. Of that, and that may be the 1907 panic one. Uh, uh, the stock market thing, running people running around, and I, I'm not going to go through this. This is just another, it's just another example where it, where what happens is here they raise what they call the haircut. They raise from zero to 20 percent. I demanded 20 percent more collateral, and it shows what happens to a bank in this calculation. He has long-term debt in there. I just want I, I did not do that in any of my numbers to understand what's going on, and it's it's a very clear article. Which is not on the reading list, but we can put it up if you want. And then what was going on until the collapse of the system, the, the, which was you can date the beginning in the, in the March to, in 2007, 2008, the, the sector was growing. So the finance is just growing and growing and growing. And so these are just some numbers about it's growing. So, so l last night I was talking to one of the people in the Treasury thing. They, they were not asking for my advice on banking things. They were asking about jobs. <laughs> And, 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 and uh, th kinds of things. Um, and I said, well, you know, the shadow, if we take this, this analysis that, that, that uh, uh, Gorton offers, uh, which says, that the, and the, the fact that the, this whole thing was a run precipitated in this shadow sector, you take the evidence that we saw the Japanese banking system go, the Swedish banking system go, we saw long-term capital management go, we had the savings and loan things, I said, why were people in the Treasury or the Fed not paying close attention to these as warning signs? 
And there was a sort of a silence. And this was a Clinton guy, of the Clinton, excuse me. He wasn't, he, this is a guy who did work with the Clinton, but he's, he's now a Obama guy, so he wasn't there during the Bush, the Bush period. But they, these guys all know each other. You remember when, when, when Damon was here, it turns out he knows the Bush Secretary of Treasury and has great respect for P Paulson uh, 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 um, and so on. So he said, well, that Alan Greenspan believed that we had two banking systems and that made us much safer than if we had one. So having one that is extraordinarily risky and unregulated, uh, and that was linked in different ways to the regular banking system, which is just as a, so it wasn't like this was completely separable. So if one goes under, the other's in grave trouble too. Banks are still going under, you'll see in a minute. Uh, in, 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 you know, real banks or, or, or we banks. And I said, that, that's a very strange view. Uh, given the facts, and that's you know, so nowadays it's easy to say, oh, well, gee, what on earth could Greenspan have been thinking not, not to have paid any attention to this? And to think that the savior for the U.S. was that we had this shadow banking system. I mean, it's just, it, it's, which is the unregulated, retrospect, absolutely risky part of the system. Well, and then I say just there were these, quote, new financial instruments, and I've got a picture of Warren Buffett, who just used the word, for, for the credit default swaps as a financial instrument of mass destruction. And some of you may remember in the middle of the, I don't know, call it the mania or something, the, 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 the bubble, he was saying things and people were saying, that old guy, he doesn't know what's ta what he's talking about. He's just talking about you know, investing in things that actually produce goods and services or something. That's crazy, you make money a different way, which you move. Those are, for those who are not familiar, those are nuclear, that's a nuclear bomb, and that's a nuclear bomb explosion um, on an island, not on, you know, some real place. We had a, over this growth of this, 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 there are various estimates of the growth of this shadow banking system. This is just derivatives outstanding, which is an indicator. You just see it went from nothing to 700 trillion dollars. So this thing just grew madly. And I, I was a little nasty here, but I just said this they exploded. Basically, it was after the gang of four, I don't know, um, which was, was Rubens, Summers, Levitt, and Greenspan. And Larry's still in a high position there, hopefully having learned some lessons. Uh, to stop this woman, Brooklyn Bourne, from trying to regulate this. And you look in retrospect, you say, oh my god, not to try to do something to monitor and regulate this? How could you have th thought this? This is, I won't go through the, the thing, but the, the credit default swap, because I want to give one example. But there's a nice little slide I found on the uh, thing on the web. Credit default swap, uh, uh, basically if my, if the bond I, if the company or the bond I own goes bad, the company goes bad, I've basically bought insurance on that from you. But unfortunately, you, the guy who was selling it to me, doesn't have any money to deliver on the insurance. So that's why that just blew up. That was, and, 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 and just a footnote, uh, Greenspan was in love with the credit default swaps because he thought that provided private sector non-governmental insurance for, for, for all these very highly leveraged deals, and which that's what he thought. This is an example. Um, I've forgotten whether I've ever mentioned this before. This is a trucking company where um, a friend of mine drives a truck for this company. And uh, the company did all the things that companies did when they thought the only way to make money was to get into finance, and they got caught. So their trucking business is fine, but the, um, the, they got into a lot of debt. Uh, what was going on then was there were credit default swaps against their their bonds. A lot of money to be made, uh, particularly since you knew that AIG or something was, the US government might just bail out the, 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 the credit default swap guys. So Goldman Sachs decided this would be a good way to make some money. We'll buy up some of the bonds, get the bonds together, and vote that they will not allow the company to reorganize. Because the normal thing when the bondholders are out is the bondholders are going to feel they're getting nothing. They certainly will take some equity and try to help the company recover. With the credit default swaps, the bondholders are betting the company crashes. 
and they can make more money with the credit default swaps. So Goldman Sachs, and then the, the, the quote in the newspaper was, all of Wall Street were underwriting a strategy to destroy this trucking company, uh, which would have, this was Christmas time, 2009. And there would have been 30,000 jobs might have been lost in the middle of this recession. A part of the real economy would have been destroyed by the financial sector through the credit default swaps. Turns out the Teamsters made a big stink. You see some big trucks there. Uh, they threatened to basically go, go to Wall Street with huge trucks and park them in the middle of the street, dot, dot. And Goldman decided, you know, this is the good, right before bonus season, this would not be good publicity for Goldman. To, to do this, and they switched, and they, they got all the bondholders together to vote to take equity, and, and, and the company may survive. But that's when, 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 uh, 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 when this was described, these credit default swaps, as a nuclear weapon of mass destruction. You can just see it. Here it is. A weapon of mass destruction that would destroy the real economy, 30,000 jobs in the middle of a great re re recession, and, and all I can say is, if the Teamsters are good guys, you understand how strange the, you know, the, 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 the world gets. The Teamsters are not normally thought of as being good guy unionists. They're, uh, in this case, they, were the, they saved these jobs. OK, then I just listed a whole bunch of, they're just, you don't have to know, I mean, I, who wants to know what all these things are? Uh, but there's a whole bunch of them. They all got these initials. And, and at the bottom, I put Ponzi schemes because they're not a whole lot different than the rest of the stuff. The Ponzi scheme is she didn't take the money and, and gamble it in Las Vegas on the hot dip, which I think is legal. It, instead, she was, the Ponzi scheme was she was going to sell more of these bonds to other people, <laughs> use that money to pay me back for my money. And you see, you see it isn't all that different than, 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 than what she's doing. Uh, OK. And then. The, 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 as they as they be made these instruments more complicated, they need more math and physics PhDs. So just that I could not, I found this hard to believe, but there was, and somebody said this, that they had to take a Cray supercomputer 48 hours to put some value on some of these CDOs. So that means nobody in the world has going to have much clue uh, of what they're worth. There's a company, you can go to their website that does some of this kinds of stuff. And so they've got indices of, of, of these things. Then they got indices of indices. It's almost like there's a, there's a, 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 a like, a, what's the correct word? It's like drinking yourself. You, 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 sometimes teenagers may do this, and no one here would ever do this, but some of you may have. You, know, you drink yourself. You don't want to quite collapse. You don't want to quite reach oblivion, but you're getting pretty close. Uh, and uh, maybe you're having a drinking game with somebody, and you know you're drinking the thing, and she's drinking the thing, and you're drinking, and she's drinking, and you know, y y et cetera. It seems like this market almost has that tendency, because pushing to risk and leverage, particularly with other pe other people's money, can make you a lot. Okay, that's now I want to talk about three things that three things that economists have studied this have said. Uh, these are these are this is the Number of banking crises. Somebody put this together. I didn't, I didn't realize that, that somebody had done this. I was proposed this in some other class that somebody do it. Uh, uh, those are banking crises. Then there's earthquakes. Those are what they call power laws. And a power law just simply says that a big event is very infrequent. You won't observe too many of them. And so sometimes people think they're not going to occur. But the really big things, the real disasters, and, the, and, and it's, it's, and I'll give you a little more of that. Thing to the right is just showing volatility of prices. And then it says almost the same thing, but in a different way. In some periods, <laughs> stock market is very, or, and, and, or foreign exchange market, very volatile. In other periods, very stable. And then the dumbest thing in the world, uh, not, maybe not be the dumbest. Guys made millions of dollars and they got away with it. But, but the, the, you know, the, is to assume that you went through a period of stability, it's going to remain stable. To assume that you didn't have a big crash or a big you know, financial run, and that it's never going to be there. Well, they're infrequent, uh, uh, but they're there. And, and so the, the fat tails, everybody in finance knew about the fat tails. But they really didn't 
for some reason didn't pay much attention. I'll give you the actual equation. Y is the frequency of the event, how often, how many there'll be, and the S is the size. The bigger the size, the, co the, the, the parameter is minus A, so you just, you can see that the bigger the uh, S, S over A, A greater than 1, it's just going to blow up. Uh, 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 um, uh, so A greater than 1, I didn't say that there. And I said, Sometimes a is two, uh, 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 um, then, it's, then the equation is quote, it's quadratic, it's inverse quadratic, I suppose you'd call it one over s squared, three, et cetera. Financial things tend to be around three. So we know that there are big events, we know that they're rare, but they are not normally distributed. The, the, the power law says it's a fatter tail. Yet people do the Black-Scholes stuff Valuing options with a Gauss with the assumption of normality. So I said they're different. And we, and we know they're different, and it's been known for a long time. So it, it should be a warning, so to say something. So then I said they're every place. So these power laws, Mandelbrot in 1963, when he was, I think that was when he was visiting Harvard uh, in the economics department, uh, indeed, he was doing some of this work. Uh, uh, and he said, look, these prices, these are cotton prices, they show a power law. Lots of times, just small changes. Every once in a while, big changes. And uh, over there is a GDP disasters of some sort. Uh, 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 and over here is public company bankruptcy filings. And you can just go through thing after thing after thing. So it is a fact that you cannot generalize from lots of small events. That is not you know, the, the right thing to do. What, what, what is important about some of these thick tails, and this is where I think guys get very worried about it, is when you have one of these power laws, and uh, um, if the parameter has certain sizes, you actually can have no, no, no theoretical variance. You know, to take the expected value of the, uh, of the, the mean <coughs> minus the, uh, 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 and this is the square, and you just you get the, the sum, you sum it up, whatever. You get you you it, it doesn't exist in, in the in the in the thing. You can always calculate with finite data. And anything that doesn't is close to not having a variance just means risk, risk, risk of these big event, because that means they could all be just you know an event that's way way out of whack with anything you've ever experienced before. And again, they know this. Uh, it's not unknown. And uh, yeah, I say here, well, lots of finance, finance is based on mean variance trade-offs. When, when you're not clear, the, mean, the variance may, may or may not be meaningful. It seems to be just margin, you know, it is, looks like it is, but it's dangerous. And then uh, Nassim Taleb calls these things black swan events. And he, call, he called that because nobody in the world believed there was, a, there was anything but white swans, at least in Europe. Uh, I don't know what there are in Asia, uh, but in the strangest place in the world, there's a black swan, and they did discover it. Does anybody know where they discovered the black swan? Uh, take a guess. Hmm? Somebody's got. I said it, I gave you a clue. It's not Europe. It's not the Americas. And it's not what we think of as the as Asia. Yes, sir. Of course, every weird thing comes from. Australia. <laughs> uh, yeah. Bang. And the idea is, yeah, they're just things, and he, he quotes, he gets very philosophical, Talib, about all this. But the idea is something we had never seen before. The only thing for certain is that we're going to come across some experience that we haven't had before in, in some sense. So you see, he does this. This is a picture of the black swan, the Australian creature. And then there's another way in which Talib makes this point. This is the uh, variance in some derivatives portfolio between 1988 and 2008. All of the variance was literally on one, he says, single day. He says, yeah. The variance, this is some portfolio. So if, for years, the portfolio is going along, barely moving. One day, it suddenly goes whoosh. And that's sort of. You can see that as a black swan event. You're going along thinking, oh, this is a safe portfolio. It's a safe portfolio. It's a safe portfolio. The stocks aren't varying very much. All of a sudden, whoosh. And, and, and so that's a, you know, sort of 
this is fact, historical fact or evidence. And here's the examples. Uh, 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 Talib gives the one of the Indy Mac, which I think I've used before. And he has something slightly nasty against uh, Ben Bernanke at the bottom. Um, but I just found a nice little one on uh, Bear Stearns. Oh, poof. Here it is, $18, million, uh, uh, $18 billion. It goes down to three and a half, and then God, then it's, you know, it's gone, basically. And that's within, that's within a, you know, a year, less than a year. Poof. Or about a year, I suppose, is that right? No, a year is a pretty short period of time in that, that universe. The volatility aspect, which, I, which I, we showed you in the other thing, this is a, one of the most famous uh, graphs in finance. And I quoted Larry Summers, who was once, once said to me, this is the only thing anyone remembers, because it was this graph by Bob Schiller. The middle thing of the graph is the rational expectations value of the stock market based on actual future dividends. Uh, so it's kind of like it's calculated. Yeah, if they really knew precisely, that's what it is. You see, it doesn't move that much. It's not that volatile. Because the real economy is not that volatile. The, the, this is the value of the companies, you know, the real companies. Then this is the stock market. And you see, well, the, well, well, basically, it's not quite a straight line, but think of it as a straight line for the moment. The real value of what we're producing is more or less a straight line during this, you know, these companies on the stock market. And the, the valuation in the stock market is adding volatility, excess volatility. And uh, I mean, this is a conclusion. I, I, I don't know how the efficient market guys could wake up in the morning and not see this and scream. Uh, because this is so a powerful piece of evidence. And, 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 and um, just now I, I go back to Larry and say, Summers, how come you didn't scream about this when you were in the, uh, in the Clinton uh, uh, Treasury Department? They, the, the, the way the, some of the finance guys do it, they call this clustered volatility. Again, Mandelbrot made the first, first real sort of serious observation on this. Well, I'm sure there were some economists who noticed it also. And they've given out a couple of Nobel Prizes for econometric analysis of this but not, not anything about what the dangers it might pose to policy regulations of the real economy. So the tech, it, you got technical awards for doing things about, you know, figuring out when you could, when, you know, these, these, this variance was really clustered. And then, you know, the, so you want to make some statistical tests of that. That's what, that's what a lot of guys did. Okay, that's the, the three macro facts that we have, you know, the, the, um, there. There's a totally different way of looking at this stuff. And, and, and we'll see at the end, I'm sort of puzzled by which gives us. This is just a look at what were the incentives for the decision makers. Uh, a whole lot of people just worry about the structure of the banking system and so on. And then there's another set of people who sit there and say, oh, it's got to do with decisions made by humans. What was motivating these guys? Well, one possibility is the financiers were ignorant. Um, I don't think that is true at all. Uh, I think they knew a lot about all this. And you can get quote after quote about guys who knew. Some people maybe didn't. But probably Alan Greenspan was the only one who didn't know somehow or other what was going on. Then there's this great quote from Jeff Imhalt, I think is a HBS graduate. Does anyone know for sure? Uh, I, th I think that's true, but nobody, will, nobody knows to contradict me. We'll, we'll stick with it tentatively. Head of GE, and in December this year, he, he made this big thing about, thank God the old generation of business leaders are gone because they were mean and greedy, terrible traits. And you can get quote after quote. John McCain uh, had a thing in the, in the middle of the crisis. You know, it, it, uh, what's his name? Charles Colson. Anybody know who he is? Oh, Charles Coulson was one of the Watergate criminals who then became a minister. He, he went to prison for a bit of time, got out, and became a, a Christian minister. And he ministers to prisoners. Um, and he said it was all, you know, this was all, there's a whole set of people say that. 
I'll leave that aside because I think, in fact, these guys are amoral and greedy. But I think uh, that that's never going to change uh, in some deep sense. That's that's what business is is about. It's about that's what economics is about. You know, self-interest doing your thing. Then there's an interesting thing about too much testosterone. And then what I called I, I come down to just to screed, which was yeah. This is the, the some little this just gives, I, I reviewed all these papers for a lecture I gave, <laughs> and so these are the papers, uh, and that's that. It, somebody unless somebody contradicts me, I will claim that that is testosterone. Uh, that's the testosterone uh, in the chemical analysis. There may be some somebody will say no, but they claimed it was on the web, so I trusted it. Uh, see somebody looking very carefully at that. I, I don't know, maybe it's wrong. And then there are just people going nuts and, 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 and stuff. And they have a whole set of studies now where they've done testosterone levels of people on stock market floors, making decisions. They've had tests actually in Harvard labs on this kind of thing. Uh, and it does look as if, yeah, the, you, you get biologically taken. And I, and I thought of Keynes's animal spirits. There's now scientific evidence <laughs> for, for, for some of this. And then they showed the say for young for guys it's erotic pictures, and and, and the financial stuff. So you want, you want to get your traders to go out there and uh, you know you, you do do stuff. You put some pornography on their things, and they say go out and take risks and make money, and they go out and do that. Uh, and then I that's a good old fashioned greed, uh, 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 which we're not putting. It just means self interest. That people, if you put a lot of money in front of them, they're going to behave. And there's some things on that. OK. And then I just took some, some, some quotes and some evidence on the greed thing. Uh, uh, this is the one I push in, in, my, in this particular lecture that I, I cited from. But then I found some Harvard B School professors who were pretty distinguished. Yeah, well, of course they were operating the corporations for the purpose of creating uh, vast wealth for senior executives. I mean. What would you do? You're in charge of this big thing. You'd want to make sure you get some money out. Um, and there was a lot of money to be gotten. They, and this is why I, I, I don't believe any of these Wall Street firms didn't know what they were doing. If you read, a lot of people, there's a quote, a lot of people knew this was bogus. This was the, the, the subprime mortgages. They knew it was trash. Liars loans, they called it. But the, the money was too good, yeah. If I can pass it off quick to somebody else, I make a lot of money. Bang. And I quoted the Mr. Cox, who is not a very good regulator. If honest practices, much of this crisis, it's a little more than honest practices. That's a very simplistic view, but there's an element to that. And then what's stunning is all these big banks were deeply entwined in the Enron um, off the books calculations. They were loaning Enron money to lie and cheat on, on their, their shareholders and everybody else. And they knew this. And you, you read the book about this. They're talking about it. And they're just sitting there saying, well, but we can get our, our money out fast. And Enron's offering a big amount. And my bonus is there. So yeah, it's just, And then there's a, a more econometric study by, by two guys at the bottom that said when you load the options with compensation, for, for some strange region, the, the, the companies start behaving more risky. And then if you know that the stock options, th they're more valuable when the shares are going up and down. Because you issue a lot of them when they're down, and you sell them when they're up. And so you want a risky company. So you give them the incentive, and that's what they do. <coughs> now we come to the re regulators. So this is the list of characters. There, there, there are more. I just put down some. Um, and what are they supposed to do? Because we, we sort of said, what is finance supposed to do? What's the regulator supposed to do? They're supposed to control criminal behavior. They didn't do that. Uh, remember, Mr. Markopoulos goes in and says, says Madoff is running a Ponzi scheme. And the SEC said, says basically, oh, he can't. He's a former head of NASDAQ, uh, et cetera. They're supposed to increase the transparency of transactions. That was another one of the Greenspan claims, was that we had such a transparent financial system. But the shadowy guys, when Damon was here, he said the, guy, the guys in the Treasury didn't know what was going on. They didn't have a clue how this was, was working. 
So if the, if, the, if the Treasury didn't know and the Federal Reserve didn't know, I don't know what transparency Greenspan could conceivably have thought about. You, you go to the shadow thing and you say, who knows anything about that? Well, there is one creature who, in principle, knows something about that. And who would that be? Who do economists believe in? Yes? The invisible hand. That's right. I was, I was giving you the best clue I could give you. I couldn't make my hand disappear as I was doing it. <laughs> but yeah, so, so apparently he thought that, that, gee, if there's a market out there, that makes it transparent. Which was, uh, uh, and then they got to clean up the financial mess. And when you talk about reducing the systemic risk, this means lowering the leverage. There's still going to be a power law, but it becomes less severe so that it reduces the chances of a big thing. It's lowering the volatility of the share prices. So the share prices are moving more steady with the real economy, not showing this risk-taking phenomenon. And then changing the incentive system. And I don't think, I know the changing the incentive system is not a matter for the Minister of Regulators. And I'm not sure, in given their, you know, their powers, how much they could do in some of these areas. But I think the Federal Reserve and the SEC could have done more than they did. That goes. Uh, they couldn't touch the shadow banking system because, A, they were stopped by the Gang of Four, and then they passed this, this, this law in 1990 basically saying uh, these derivatives were, were considered uh, un, you know, unregulated. So you couldn't regulate them even if a bank was running them. And then, so what they're going to do is they're going to clean up the mess. And this is what we're going to be doing. So this is the FDIC. This is the real banks. Uh, so you see the accumulated costs. You see the assets going down. Real banks were entwined in this situation. They crashed. They're crashing every day. They're every, every, every day, they're real banks going down. Um, you know, maybe we'll only be left with city corn gold at the end. Who knows? Uh, and you see that they're running in debt. They're spending more. And that means taxpayers are going to be putting more money into this. Here's the bank failures. Uh, per week in 2009, and it, it's kept going in 2010. Just bank failures going up and up and up. We haven't yet reached the, the bank failures of the whole um, of the Great Depression. And that's because nobody, you know, this isn't, these banks are going down, but people aren't losing their money, and you're not seeing panic throughout the system. Why? Because it's insured, and I know that Cambridge Saving goes, my money's safe. Uh, uh, so I'm, uh, uh, so, so it's not going to, so Cambridge is not going to go down because I run to the bank. Uh, and start taking my money out, and you take your money out. So they're going down, but not so bad. The, 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 the last comment on the regulation that I want to make um, is this question of regulatory capture. Can you actually regulate these characters? So I, coded, I quote Ken Galbraith, who's uh, got this, the book on the Great Crash, which is just a marvelous sort of quick read you can do. And he refers to these Regulators, in this lifestyle sense, uh, they mellow in an old age, become an arm of the industry or regulating. Well, there's the gang of four doing, doing their part. There's Ned Gramlich, who warned about the housing prices. And Ned Gramlich's a very serious economist, you know, dedicated kind of, you know, kind of person you, you would trust to run a bank. <laughs> it's just that you would trust him. You know, maybe if a few billion was there, you wouldn't, but... Uh, you know, under any reason. And uh, Greenspan just basically told the Federal Reserve people ignore him. He's, he was a commissioner, so he had some power, some authority. 2001, she's still in, 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 in business, Sheila Blair. Uh, she's a Bush appointee. Uh, and she tried to get the subprime guys to drop to practice. Ignored. Then we have Mark Compolis. And so I, I just said these guys, they absconded from their responsibilities. They did not do what their jobs said they should do. I'm not sure we can sue them or put them in jail for this. It's very hard, because a lot of the judgment things, I assume it's not possible. But it's clear they were not doing what they were supposed to do. And there are some reasons why they might not. The first one is called the Patty Hearst, or Stockholm or Patty Hearst syndrome. Anybody know what that is? 
Anybody remember what happened to Patty Hearst? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so these guys deal with these people all the time. They deal with the big bankers. Tim Geithner's on the telephone with, the, uh, with Goldman every day. Um, and so the, the, the State Department's called going native. Where if you're, if, you're the, if you're a State Department official and you're in, I had a friend, the World Bank did this. She's Spanish, she worked with Mexico. She knows Spanish very well. She's a very good economist, wonderful. Harvard PhD. And they appointed her chief economist for the Ukraine. I remember saying, how could, what do you do that for? You know no Ukrainian. You know nothing. You, you've never had a course in Russian style of Why do that? He said, oh, it's very simple. They felt I was getting too sympathetic to the Mexicans. And so they sent me a place where I cannot possibly get sympathetic. And all I'll do is repeat the can't things that the bank wants you to do, which is, they had certain, which is Washington consensus rules. OK, so the, the, it's things there. Government hires Wall Street employees for jobs, and Wall Street hires government employees for jobs. So I got some figures for people who left Congress to lobby, not only for Wall Street. So I haven't got Wall Street figures only. Uh, so that's a, a problem with those, those statistics. Then they, they buy the politicians. And then I think the worst one of all is the spirit of the times, which I think caught a lot of people in Greenspan, you know, et cetera. Well, the money was rolling in. You know, you don't, you don't, that, that's sort of from Evita, but you don't ask how. That's from Argentina. The, uh, thing. So there's a set of reasons why these regulators seem to get trapped in this process. Uh, um, and if you're a regulator and you know you can get a good job with a Wall Street firm paying 10 times your current salary, you're going to regulate a bit differently than otherwise. Uh, and then I, I said, well, the word, we could, you could use the crony capitalism. You know, Secretary of Treasury comes from Goldman Sachs. Uh, Ruben Leaves joined Citicorp, which even the Wall Street Journal was a little taken aback by that. You know, uh, uh, um, you know Paulson lets Slayman fail, bails out AIG, which then puts $20 billion into his old company, Goldman Sachs. You just sort of sit there and you say, oh, the right, the, the right thing. Uh, the JP Morgan guy was forced to leave the uh, New York Fed board, uh, when it was discovered that he was involved in the bailout of, uh, of, of, you know, of, of the, he was involved, he sat on the board of the Fed New York Fed while his company, J.P. Morgan, was, was being pressured on the buyout of, of Merrill Lynch. Just, you know, you just sort of sit there and say, w w wait a second, don't you, that, he was forced to leave only after, again, the press made a big, a bit of this. You go right through the thing, and it's this, and then I quoted a a great and famous American, uh, and this is a very famous quote, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. Um, I changed two words. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the, my words, financial political complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Does anybody, does it strike a bell with anybody? Yes, okay, go ahead, tell us who is it. That's Eisenhower. And he just said the military industrial complex. And my claim is if he were looking today, he wouldn't worry about the military industrial complex. You might, might worry about that, but you would, that clearly is not the danger to the, to the country that Boeing is building you know, planes and hiring the generals. That, that's probably still there, but not, no. It's this financial political complex that's doing exactly what troubled him about the, the, the military and the industry was that the generals who were making the decisions upon what things to purchase would retire, and then they would be hired by the company they'd given the big contract to, and you just didn't believe that they'd be making the best decisions, even if they were you know, sort of honest people. They just couldn't be. Uh, so I, 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 I wish we had a more Eisenhower doctrine at this present moment. And so the, 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 I got two, two additional comments, and I'll be done. The, the, the idea that these financial instruments are always changing. You regulate the banking sector, they fight for some deregulation, and they set up a shadow banking sector. It seems like they're always trying to push towards. So that means your regulation can't be that, st that stable. You can't lock things in. You've got to really be moving with them. So I went through some things here about moving with them. Uh, and I don't know how, how good they are. 
and, and then, I don't know how, how good a lead in this will be to the Rebetto, but it is, it is my, my sort of lead. I think there's two ways of thinking about this stuff. One is as a structure problem. And then you, see, you have the people who do the proximate causes. Now it's the mortgage thing that un unraveled. It's the repo market, which, which is what Gorton stresses. Um, you know, and you can stress some other things. It's the derivatives growing so bad. And, 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 and it's useful to know that. OK, those are proximate. There's a deeper cause, um, which is that the system seems to always be moving towards the edge of potential disaster. There's a model of that called the sand pile model, which says you put drops of sand, then the, the, the pile breaks. You know, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. So these guys almost are doing, and it's what leveraging, I think, is, is it pushes you to the point where you, you can just carry, you're the camel. But if just by chance the wind blows one more straw, you go under. And there's also a model of this of forest fires. You put the trees close together because you want to maximize, and you just, you know, just if there's, a, if there's a fire, all the whole forest will burn down. And that's one whole sort of type of analysis people do. The other analysis, and it's intertwining these things that I think would be most interesting, is to look at the incentives. It wasn't the money of, uh, of, uh, of many of these stock guys that was at stake. They didn't care about the mortgages because they packaged them, sold them off, and got fees. They don't care what they sell. Uh, so that's incentives. And you wonder how you can control those incentives so they are more caring. The culture of these things, and I think it partly comes from the incentives, but it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's caveat amateur. Goldman has been saying about the things they did with the Greeks. When they do doing the Greeks, they also were writing credit default swaps for the Greeks to crash. You sort of sit there and say, wait a minute. Here I am uh, selling Roberto Re some, some things, and I'm going to his wife and selling that what he's doing is going to fail. It, 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 it's, it's legal, it was pointed out in the paper today. And it's natural for a bank to do this, to try to make money. You know. But somehow or other, it isn't quite right. Either they think the thing is, either they should be warning. Hey, I'm going to be writing these swaps against you, because I really think you're making a terrible decision. Don't take this medicine, rather than taking the medicine and buying insurance on him. He said, OK, you want this medicine here. And, and, and the fiduciary culture has somehow or other has to say, hey, we're responsible for these people. If, if, if they crash, I mean, you, th you think the Goldman Sachs guy should say, we helped Greece cheat on their debts, and now there may be a world, another world crash, or the euro may go. We, we participated in that. And that's not the culture. The culture is going to be, we made money on that. And they were just stupid. Uh, that's, and then the, we have the last thing. So my last word, and here's for Roberto, is um, I looked at all this. It's very complicated, those things. And so you all can read that, I'm sure. Uh, Roberto. Good. I'm going to put this up, Richard. OK, this, yeah, go, this yeah I'll, turn, I'll turn this off. I've written something here on the blackboard. OK. If I can figure this out. Uh, our theme today is the regulation of finance. And uh, as always, uh, my chief concern is to use the experience of the crisis and the response to the crisis as a provocation to rethink our ideas about the economy as a whole and about its transformative possibilities. I shall make four sets of remarks. The first two sets are intended to connect what we are discussing now to our theoretical conversation over the last two classes. The first set of remarks is about the implications of the programmatic response to the crisis that we explored last week for today's theme of the regulation of finance. The second set of remarks is about finance itself 
and its inherent or systemic instability, and the implications of that instability for the theme of regulation and reorganization of finance. The third set of remarks, which is really the heart of what I want to propose today, is to describe the established agenda of the regulatory reform of finance, its components, and then to suggest what is missing from that agenda. And the final and fourth set of remarks has to do with the political background to this contest as a partial explanation for the limitations of the present agenda. So first, the programmatic response to the crisis in general and its implications for the regulation and reorganization of finance. I remind you of the thesis with which I concluded my intervention in the last class. We can distinguish two problems. One of them I call the min-max problem. The maximum stimulus that seems to be fiscally sustainable and politically feasible in the present circumstances, the circumstances not only of the United States, but of the other major contemporary economies, <coughs> will not be large enough decisively to overcome the slump. It may be large enough to prevent the aggravation of the crisis, but not large enough to ensure a decisive recovery of economic activity. This problem, I claimed, is insoluble. When it is viewed in isolation, however, it may become soluble to the extent that we think of it and deal with it in conjunction with the second problem. The second problem is the problem of recovery and reform. In the medium term, according to this argument, we can devise a strategy of socially inclusive economic growth. And that strategy will be distinguished, among other attributes, by its commitment to broaden the gateways of access to the advanced sectors of production. That is to say, to reorganize the economy on the basis of a decisive and institutionalized widening of economic and educational opportunity. To the extent that we succeed in the medium term in establishing such a strategy of socially inclusive economic growth, this medium term success in conjunction with the short term partial success in dealing with the crisis through the inadequate stimulus is our best chance of advance. Now, what are the implications of this thesis for our thinking about the regulation and reorganization of finance? The regulation of finance, understood as a down payment or a first step in the attempt to reorganize the relation between finance and the real economy is an intermediate link between the short term and the medium term. That is to say, between the design of the stimulus and the design of the program of socially inclusive growth. Uh, to serve this purpose, the regulation and reorganization of finance should include two main directions. 
The first direction is what you could call the democratization of finance. The broadening of access to credit, especially to producer credit, not consumer credit. And to insurance against economic risk. Not just the risks that are currently insured, but the broader risks that might be insured. Let me give you a homely example of this democratization of finance with respect to innovation in insurance against risk. An example in the sector of agriculture. In the whole world, agriculture always confronts the problem of the superimposition of physical risk, volatility of climate, and economic risk, volatility of price. The traditional instruments with which to uh, manage this combination of physical and economic risk, minimum price supports or regulated food, food stockpiles, are in the process of being replaced in the whole world by uh, a new set of financial products and services, of financial options. And the problem that exists in the world is that these, this advanced financial engineering is normally accessible only to large-scale agribusiness, not to small and medium-sized producers. So it would be necessary for the government to act to repackage these financial products and services in a way that would make them accessible to small-scale producers. The second direction that should be taken by this attempt to establish the intermediate link between the short-term stimulus program and the medium-term project of socially inclusive economic growth would be a series of institutional innovations designed to tighten the link between finance and the real economy. To prevent the productive potential of saving from being squandered in a financial casino and to mobilize long-term saving more effectively for long-term productive investment. For example, to use the powers of government to mimic the activities of private venture capital by mobilizing part of the pension saving of society for a variety of diversified investment funds that would help finance startup and emergent business. Now I come to my second set of remarks, once again relating what we're discussing now to what we discussed last week. The second set of remarks is about finance. I claimed last week that financial activity is systemically unstable. Not just because of the waves of euphoria and panic to which it is subject, but because of the very nature of the institutional setting in which it operates. Now I make a preliminary general remark. What we see in the theoretical literature about finance is an example of the overwhelming psychological bias in the mainstream of economic thinking. All the laws that Richard Freeman referred to are typically given a behavioral or psychological basis in the literature. Where this mainstream form of thinking is most efficient is 
in its institutional imagination. In the imagination of the distinctive character and the decisive effects of the established institutional setting of finance, and also in the imagination of the possible institutional alternatives. According to that view that I sketched last week, finance is unstable as well because of the nature of its institutional setting. And I gave a list of features of this setting that render finance unstable. the technological revolutions, the economic effect of which is always mediated by institutional arrangements. The haphazard character of the institutional setting, which is now characterized by a partial hollowing out of the New Deal or social democratic settlement of the mid 20th century. The asymmetry between economic and political power so that a force that loses out in the economy can strike back in politics. The inability of the democratization of credit, of consumer credit, to make up for the failure of redistribution and especially redistribution that's based on a broadening of opportunity rather than simply on retrospective tax and transfer. Uh, and the subjection of the monetary policy of the central banks to intellectual fashion or ideological influence, and finally, what I call international anarchy. The fact that the major economies in the world operate now on radically different presuppositions with regard to the terms of their engagement with the world. So from the, these factors that constitute the, in, the institutional setting of finance, there arise uh, uh, vast forces of potential instability that are, as it were, beyond the horizon of the internal world of finance. So that even the most adept speculators and professionals are barely able to understand them, much less to control them. Now, this problem becomes salient in the context of what has been the dominant strategy for the regulation of finance in the second half of the 20th century. And that is the strategy that can be called regulatory dualism. The essential characteristic of that strategy is the distinction between a thickly regulated sector and a thinly regulated sector. The justification for the distinction is supposedly that in the thinly regulated sector, the agents are high net worth individuals or financial professionals who require less paternalism. Now, there are two objections to this strategy of regulated dualism. The first one was mentioned last week. If there is such a regulatory dualism, then everything that is prohibited in the thickly regulated sector can be redesigned and executed in the thinly regulated sector. The thinly regulated sector can be used to circumvent the thickly regulated sector. 
But there's a second objection as well to the strategy of regulatory dualism. The second objection is that the inherent and systemic instability of finance that results from the very nature of its institutional setting cannot be effectively combated or controlled by a strategy of thin regulation. And this as well, the strategy of regulatory dualism fails to take into account. If the problem of instability resulting from the institutional setting of finance becomes most salient in the context of the strategy of regulatory dualism, the strategy of regulatory dualism in turn becomes uh, most revealing of its deficiencies in the context of the shadow banking problem that Richard Freeman uh, invoked. Uh, shadow banking is the most dramatic manifestation in the present crisis of the nature and consequences of this regulatory dualism. And I now want just to read a, a brief passage from a commentary of an expert on shadow banking who I consulted. Shadow banking is the form of finance that remains when the banking system has been allowed to fail. It is the truth of the current banking system. In theory, it was supposed to provide a second source of funding for productive investment. In fact, it could perform that function only when the funding decisions were taken somewhere else, that is, by real banks or government-sponsored banking entities. When those banks were allowed to fail, Shadow banking, too, had to fail, revealing the bankruptcy of the system as a whole, not merely the part that appeared in the shadows. What Gorton and others see are the technical differences that distinguish banking from capital markets. What they fail to see is that the problem is a problem of substance, not technique. Capital markets serve a valid function when they provide liquidity to productive investment. In the absence of productive investment, speculative trading is all that remains. Now I come to my third set of remarks about the established agenda of the regulatory reform of finance and what is missing from it. The agenda that is now discussed in the United States, and indeed in all the advanced economies, has four components, and I've labeled them here on the top of the blackboard. The first component I called the technocratic agenda. And it is today concerned mainly with ensuring to the government supervisory authority to deal with systemic risk, and resolution authority, that is to say, authority to liquidate failed financial institutions. The second agenda I call the Basel Agenda, and it is associated with the group of governors of the central banks uh, and with the Bank of, in of International Settlements. It is concerned with tightening the rules about the capital adequacy of the banks and the rules about the restraints on leverage, the capital leverage ratios. The third agenda I labeled here the New Deal agenda. It is the classical regulatory agenda. And it is exemplified in the present debates in the United States by the proposals to uh, reaffirm the separation of proprietary trading from the activities of banks that take governmentally insured deposits. 
And the fourth agenda is the consumer protection agenda, exemplified by the proposal to establish a new consumer protection agency. What is missing from this established agenda? What is missing from it is any proposal that would understand and design the regulation of finance as a down payment or a first step in the attempt institutionally to reshape the relation between finance and the real economy. Precisely the subject of my first two sets of remarks. So first what is missing is a concerted attack on the strategy of regulatory dualism. Even though the strategy of regulatory dualism is one of the chief causes of the chaos in finance and is the, the, the axis of the way in which finance was regulated in the second half of the 20th century, to this day there is still no systematic criticism of regulatory dualism and no attempt to replace it as a whole. And the problem of shadow banking is simply the most dramatic instance of the consequences of the strategy of regulatory dualism. The second element that is missing from the established agenda of the regulation of finance would be the series of innovations that would exemplify what I called earlier the democratization of finance. with these two elements. The first element is the broadening of access to producer credit and to insurance against economic risks. The principal focus would be small business and small banks. And the second major example of this democratization of finance would be innovation in the arrangements designed to mobilize long-term saving for long-term productive investment. For example, the use of part of the accumulated pension saving of society to fund the function of venture capital. The incorporation into the agenda of regulation of finance of these two missing elements would transform the regulation of finance into an attempt to reorganize the relation between finance and the real economy and thus help provide the missing link between the short-term program of stimulus and the medium-term project of the organization of socially inclusive economic growth. Now I make my fourth and final set of remarks. To understand this failure, which is in the first instance a failure of imagination, and particularly of institutional imagination, we have to grasp the political as well as the intellectual background to the debates now taking place in the United States and in the other major economies of the world. You could say that the contestants, the participants in the American debate about the regulation of finance are these. In the first place, a group of technocrats or economic mandarins, professorial mandarins, entangled up to their necks with the financial interests. In the second place, certain business lobbies, like the lobby of the small banks, that are ambivalent in their relation to the big banks. In the third place, 
the consumer protection groups that propose what I call there the consumer protection agenda. And in the fourth place, labor. Now greatly weakened, but still present in the debate, organized labor. Now there is a missing contestant, an absent participant in this debate. And that is the progressives within or outside the Democratic Party in the United States. Where are they? What is their project? And an analogous situation reappears in all the major economies in the world. The progressives have no project with which to respond to the experience of the crisis. And the left generally understood, rather than profiting politically from the crisis as might have been expected to happen, has in almost the whole world been set back by the crisis mysteriously. A significant element in this political situation is the intellectual element the failure of an idea, the absence of a conception. Uh, and thus, uh, the explanation for why that final approach that I discussed last week, the progressive structural approach, remains largely an empty box, an empty set without programmatic content or political direction. It is for that reason that I want to insist in these uh, conversations on the relation between the transformative opportunity and the missing ideas, without which the immense transformative opportunity presented by the crisis will continue to be wasted. Would you like to say something first, Richard, about this? Um, y yes, because uh, uh, um, the, 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 I mean, the, the fact that there is a missing set of ideas, I, I think th that is correct. And partly there is a missing set of I, but, but somehow or other we have to offer the ideas. I mean, it, it's it's you know, it's it's pointing out a hole in the in the in the wall. We got to figure out how to fix the hole. Um, and you know, if, if, if someone has some awesome ideas how to actually do the thing, I, 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 it wouldn't shock me that the ideas would take off. Um, if we look back to the to the Rose, to the uh, Roosevelt period, the ideas that, that were developed um, were developed earlier, most of them, and they were tried out in states, in, in, in the, the Wisconsin, New York, probably something had to have been tried in Massachusetts, um, and they had some different set of ideas they were trying out in uh, Louisiana. <laughs> uh, and I think one of the one of the, the, the difficulties has been the for, for this idea issue is the when the um, Democrats or the progressives or get into power, uh, they also try to centralize things. They uh, when they're out of power, they seem to spend most of their time trying to think of how to get into power rather than, uh, let's say, thinking of dealing with a crisis. And it is hard. If you're in the middle of, the, of a booming period and you don't think 
be one progressive or conservative about what could go wrong and prepare yourself for the, you know, for new, new, new ideas. I think there, it's, it's a complicated issue. I don't, I don't know if I understand fully, you know, where the new ideas come from. And for the moment, let's not say we're asking for, you know, I don't know, Adam Smith to reappear or Lord Keynes to reappear, but they'll come from a group, the way you phrased it, I think was correct, from progressives, conservatives. Um, and I, th I think that takes a long time. And what, one of the things that has happened has been that uh, if you made an effort to try to think of new ideas during the Clinton administration, no. The guys are in power. There are guys, would be the, the left view. I think the conservatives get into the same problem, too. Uh, that's why we have, a, a, I think, a major absence of conservative stuff. Well, when you're in power, you just defend the government. And if things are going well, it makes you even more so. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a question of how you actually develop a continual, let's call it critical idea set, and people always looking more into the future and I, I've not seen that for, you know, in this country. For, there was a certain amount of that when the conservatives were absolutely out and the Chicago people did develop ideas. Turns out a lot of them didn't work. Some, some did, you know, but, but on the bulk, they, they don't seem to be offering any ideas right now. As a, as a, you know, so I, I think that it's got to be some, some deeper thought to how and under what conditions you can generate the ideas and try them out. Nobody's going to come with an idea or some, some schema uh, and go to Washington and somebody's going to say, yeah, let's do this. You, you, so the, a lot of the things have to be on the federalist or local level where you, you say, we've tried this in our state or in our city. We succeeded in doing this uh, and therefore we can maybe scale it up. Lots of stuff doesn't, is, you know, doesn't scale, too. We, we know that. The, the successful things that, that don't, uh, uh, that, that don't uh, scale. It, it, once they get in power, they are only worried about daily crisis. That's the, they, they're gone. I mean, so you can't, it's very hard to imagine. So if you didn't come into power with a set of absolute ideas, you, says, you sit down and say, why did the Obama guys push the uh, health care. They were not elected to push health care in the sense the way Clinton was. It wasn't the issue in the election and the people voted for you to do this. It was much more, that was the last idea that Democrats had. And so they just latched onto it. And the, the world changed and people were, were, were I mean, the, the health care needs to be resolved and all this, but, but the, you know, people are more concerned about the, the loss of jobs and the financial sector, and they didn't have an idea. And if you think about where their ideas were, the Hamilton Project, which was funded by Bob Rubin, and, and uh, was the democratic effort to have ideas for the new administration, which they thought was going to be Hillary Clinton, but they switched over very quickly. And so you have to have a set of people who were, say, intellectual, were thinking, but, but they were certainly not thinking out of any box, and they were thinking of, Wall Street, as always, the same way the Clinton guys, because that looked still successful to them, that they had deregulated, and they had the, the dot-com thing. We survived that. That would, didn't destroy us. And they couldn't, they couldn't readjust their thinking, I think. And uh, that's partly why you're, you're seeing such a sluggish or whatever the right, the right word, word is. Had Roosevelt, I would bet, had, had the Depression developed, had Roosevelt been elected a lot earlier, and the Depression developed with Roosevelt, there would have been greater troubles of there of pushing a, a, you know, a, a different uh, a, a agenda. Because they, remember, Roosevelt ran, ran on a campaign of Hoover had spent too much money. He'd broken the budget deficits. And, and, and um, you know, but he couldn't do those policies once he was in because it was so blatant. Uh, uh, you might have said maybe the, uh, the, 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 if you regard the Obama group as sort of progressive, it's only Democrats, maybe had they gotten in a year later when they, they, would, have, they would have had the chance to rethink their, their things. But they were going in on the finance and on the, what turns out to the key issues 
with the notion of Clinton, balanced budget under R Rubin, uh, and, we'd had, and we'd had this great jobs growth. That was, that was, that was their sort of experience. And that's, uh, that's the guys in the Treasury called me yesterday. The whole thing was, how can we re-get the Clinton growth of, of jobs? What, why is it not working? Well, why, I mean, the, the, it's not that they don't think the stimulus does something, but they are not happy in their heart of hearts. Uh, and they, they do foresee. And they also foresee being out of office, possibly. Because they, uh, uh, um, and uh, sadly, I must say, I said, I'll think. But I didn't say, I have an immediate solution. Here it is. You do this, this, or this. Because when you, often when you do say those solutions to people in, in, in government, they immediately say, no, we can't do that. No, we can't do this, we can't do that, we can't do this. Okay. You know, we, can't, we can't give you more money to the states to stop them from bleeding because the Congress won't allow that and the Republicans will you know, filibuster or die on the spot if they give more money to this government. That's not the solution. The solution has got to be the private sector. You, you, uh, uh, so I think it's, it's so some interims where you can have these ideas perhaps formed, but you're not going to have them formed in the middle of a crisis is my guess. Wonder whether the class would like to intervene. Yes. I have a question. Do you, don't you see some sort of advantage in when you talk about the last idea, the last radical you thinking? In some ways, I don't know, some people might say that there is some sort of advantage in that. In that when you have this influx of radical left, right, um, economic you know, new notions, you have a lot of instability. And maybe thinking inside the box, inside this, um, you talked about the butchered Keynesianism. Maybe there is, um, and I don't know, I'm, what do you think about that? But there is a, some sort of, of uh, advantage in not going and pursuing these radicalized um, options. Uh, the instability already exists. The instability wasn't created by ideas. There's more of an argument to say it was created by the absence of ideas. Uh, there's a there's a there's a basic intuition here underlying this argument. Uh, it, certainly underlying my interventions here in the class in this argument. Uh, the intuition is that the financial crisis is the financial and economic crisis is most interesting as an opportunity to rethink and to reorganize the real economy. Uh, and the problem, the basic problem in the real economy is that the way things are organized now, the vast majority of people don't have the requisite educational and economic equipment to use their creative and constructive potential. So that a country like the United States, seething with energy and ingenuity, is a country in which a vast amount of human potential goes squandering. And then on the basis of that intuition, the question is, is the financial crisis, rather than just being a threat, an opportunity to change things with respect to that basic underlying problem? That's, that's the intuition. And that intuition fights with the attitude that controls the dominant way of thinking, which is the financial crisis is simply a threat. It's not an opportunity. It's a, a shadow cast over uh, the situation that existed. And notice it's not just the leftists who object to that view. It's what I called last week also the conservative structuralists. So they say the basic problem in, a con in an economy like the United States is that the United States has ceased to produce enough things that the rest of the world wants. And this problem is being masked by the pseudo-democratization of credit and by debt-driven trade. And now the mask has fallen off. Yes, sir. 
I, uh, <clears throat> I'm very glad to be hearing this conversation because I actually used to study in an English department where I was naturally surrounded by radical leftists. And one of the reasons I switched to law school was uh, my continual bafflement. It seemed to me at the time, and this was earlier in the 2000s, that uh, I would think back to Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Friedman for, uh, Freedom, for example, and uh, what a powerful book that ended up being, written in the wilderness, and then Reagan comes along, and to some extent, it becomes reality. I even heard it inspired Schwarzenegger's political career, too, so it continues to have an effect somehow. And I would look around at my colleagues in the English department and wonder, um, where is the equivalent to Friedman's Capitalism and Friedman, uh, Freedom? What would you have your Reagan do if you got a Reagan? And I never, I never heard an answer to that. Um, and it's especially frustrating now that, in a sense, at least the progressives, if not the left, do seem to have what could have been something like a Reagan in a moment, like a Reagan-esque moment, and it just hasn't come together. So my question was for Professor Unger, because I know you're also teaching a class on the future of the left, I believe, and you're very good at offering uh, encapsulations of thought. I was wondering if you could, this is probably too large of a question, but if you could give us any insight from that class, uh, if you've come across any answers there that might help shed light on this mystery? <laughs> so that is too large a question. And it is, it is a subject in which I'm passionately interested. But my proposal is that in this class, we can address that subject uh, in a particular domain, which is this, as today, in this, in this issue of, of whether the regulation of finance can be a first step in the reorganization of the relation of finance to the real economy, and the reorganization of the relation of finance to the real economy can be a first step in the reshaping of the market economy as a whole. Uh, now, I think the, uh, here's another way to answer your question. It relates to something that I said in the very first class. There are, there, are, there are two traditions of reform in the United States. Two traditions of progressive reform. One tradition is defend the small against the big. That's the tradition that goes from Jefferson through Brandeis. Then the second tradition is accept the big and regulate it by the powers of a strong national government. The problems that the United States and other contemporary societies face, to my mind, cannot be successfully accommodated within the limits of those two traditions and require a reorganization of the institutional arrangements that define the market economy for the purpose of making socially inclusive growth possible. And this crisis should be a tremendous transformative opportunity to put such ideas and institutional experiments on the table. And up to now, it hasn't been. But in part, that's because there is no list of ideas. The capitalism freedom had a lot of you know, payons to capitalism and, the, and so on and so forth. It also had a bunch of specific suggestions, some of which have worked and some of which haven't. So you could go through there and you could say, this is what they wanted to do. Absolutely. And you, know, you could make possibly a list of things uh, um, that would appeal, but they, 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 in, 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 and might possibly uh, attract some, some, some interest among the uh, uh, progressives or conservatives for that matter, that would be quite different. But uh, you have to have them. And, if, and, and, and if, if you don't have your capitalism and freedom and your 20 or 30 years in the, in the desert, uh, in some sense, um, you, you often don't develop them. Yes, but I just want to say one thing about that, Richard. So uh, uh, the most, uh, one of the most intelligent comments ever made about the New Deal was that all of Roosevelt's programs failed, but that the New Deal as a whole was a success. And 
that is a, uh, that tells something about the nature of the programmatic imagination of transformative politics. So uh, I, I, to my mind, a programmatic argument should not be understood as a blueprint. It's not just a loose list of institutional gimmicks because uh, what matters is the direction. And in any powerful direction, there are a large number of institutional arrangements that are part, partial functional equivalents for one another. And it doesn't matter that any one of them is an absolute success. What matters is the direction that they establish. So in a programmatic argument, or in a, a project of transformative politics, the two most important attributes are these. First, that you are able to define a direction that can be exemplified by a broad range of experiments. And second, that you can define a series of very tangible first steps, what to do tomorrow to begin moving in that direction in a particular circumstance. And those two attributes together, the, the demarcation of the trajectory and the very tangible definition of the first steps are then what define a project, a transformative project. That's fair enough. I think we're actually out of time. That's a perfect ending. Uh, so everyone will think of transformative things as they work on the second essay. Because we got the worst set of transformative guys. Oh, in the face oh Richard, my, I have actually a suggestion for the next classes. What is the next? Recess, recess, which is, which is just that we. Get